Can say hello. Just yeah, you can say hello and, and you can start. Um, Manu needs okay, no more new start. introductions. We uh, we have a, a limit how many introductions we're allowed to give people. So Rabbi Liebtag, one of the founders of Torah Online, in a sense, you know, years and years ago before it was popular. So Vakasha, next contradiction between Bamidbar and Dvarim. I'm sorry. From Torah Online to Torah in Motion. Torah Online to Torah in Motion. There we go. Okay. It's all yours. Let me explain why we picked this topic. Our last topic uh, before Shavuot, we were discussing the different accounts of the Torah being given. We had in Shmot and we had in Mishpatim and we also had in Sefer Dvarim. And everyone was hoping that I would explain why the Ten Commandments in Dvarim are different than the ones in Shmot, which I didn't deal with on purpose because the main goal of that year was to understand why they're repeated in Dvarim, and that was an excuse not to explain the differences, but explain the purpose of Sefer Dvarim, which brought up the question, how come Sefer Dvarim is different? So before you can answer that question, we had to understand what is Sefer Dvarim about. So because of that, um, we decided to pick a topic of the differences between Dvarim and the other books. And what I'm going to try to do week by week, we're going to go sort of like Parsha Shavua, and each week I'm going to find something that relates to that's in Devarim that relates to Parshat Shavua. Um, so this week, I'm going to relate to the Parshat Shavua in America, which is this week is Balotcha. Next week, we'll do Shlach. And for some reason, I mentioned uh, Yitro for this week's topic, but Parshat Yitro is not this week's Parsha, but in a certain way it is. Um, anyone know why? What does Yitro have to do with Parshat Balotcha? If you can use your chat or you can unmute yourself and say something. They actually can't unmute themselves now. Oh, they can't unmute so you can the chat. I apologize for that. If they really want, but uh, okay. at the end of class, then they can ask. So we have questions. So listen, Jay, today remind me 10 minutes before the end to stop so I can answer questions because every time I never get to them. Okay. So yes. David said very, very good. The, the, actually, the, um, um, very good. What, what, um, what someone there wrote was that we mentioned Ruel, who Chazal identifies Yitro. Because before we leave Harsina in the end of chapter 10, Moshe invites um, his, his uh, in-law, his Ruel, who Chazal says Yitro, to come along with them. It's unclear whether or not he comes. But if you read carefully, it doesn't say Yitro there. It says Ruel ben, I mean, it says, I'm sorry, it says Chovav ben Ruel. And if I read this simple shot, and I'll follow Eben Ezra, Ruel is another brother of Yitro. In other words, according to Chumash, Sipora's father's name is Ruel, is Ruel. It says so. But Tabona Ruavihen. And the word chotein can mean any in-law. Because any relationship through marriage is called a chatan, and any relationship through blood is called an ach. Like Anashim Achim Anachno. They can be cousins. Therefore, and the only time we have the word chotein in Chumash is in the story of Yitro and by the Arayot and by in the story of Pelegash Begiva. If you check them all out, Chotein can easily mean any in-law. Not just a father-in-law, but any in-law. Therefore, it makes, if I follow Chumash, then Ruel is the father, and Tzipora um, has two brothers, besides her six other sisters. One brother is uh, Yitro, the other brother is Ruel. And what happens? Um, when Moshe first came, Ruel was the Kohen of Midian. And, but Moshe was there for many, many years, for many decades. And therefore, when Ruel passed on, his son Yitro took over the job and became Kohen Midian. There was another brother whose name was Chovav. Chovav needs a job. And Moshe Rabbeinu was offering Chovav to be a tour guide to help him go through the desert. Wait, that's not our topic today. But that was the right wrong reason of why Yitro is in this week's Parsha. Um, the reason why Parsha Yitro is in this week's Parsha is the famous advice of Yitro to appoint judges for Moshe to get some help we have a very similar story in the beginning of Sefer Tvarim. And everyone, almost all the Parshim, try to understand why is the story in Yitro about appointing the judges different than the story in Tvarim. And we're going to see, most likely, the story in Tvarim is more similar to the appointment of 70, el of 70 leaders in Parshat, uh, in chapter 11, in Parshat Balotcha, in the story of the, um, of the Mitavim, which we'll get to soon. Okay, that was my introduction. Now, whoever came, uh, little by little, the numbers are coming up. So I was able to stall from 40 to 61. So now it's ever online. <laughs> it's starting. It's called Jewish Time. And now I'm going to share with you my screen and my outline. The table can be nice and organized. 
I hope. And here's my outline. Where's my outline? Here we go. There's outline from Sefer Tvarim, and we're going to begin as follows. Okay. So first, um, we talked about the reasons for the series. Okay. So first topic is why Yitro isn't mentioned in Tvarim. Okay. So I want to give a little introduction. I'll make this a little bit bigger so you don't see what's going on below. Uh, let's make it. Um, make it that bigger. Okay. So my first topic is going to be what I call objective analysis versus subjective interpretation. This is an overall, overall approach to when you study Chumash. In almost every share, when it's presented properly, the first uh, part of every share should be what we call objective analysis, meaning you read the text, you study the text, you try to translate the text, what it's about, and you analyze what's the purpose of the text, what's the meaning of the text, are there key words, and that's what's called objective because either, um, either that's what it means, that's what it doesn't mean. I simply read it objectively, and then sometimes I'll compare it to other texts. After you study the text objectively and notice something, notice maybe a key word or notice a, uh, a contradiction, then I do a subjective interpretation. I'll give you a classic example. When you study the story of creation, you'll notice that day one is parallel to day four, day two is parallel to day five, and day three is parallel to day six. I'm pretty sure I've done that share before with you. Um, now, Chumash, when I do an objective analysis, that is an objective observation that is easy to prove. It's simply, it's parallel. You can't miss the fact that or on day one is parallel to Morot on day, on day four. That um, the birds, the fish, and the uh, fowl on day five, which are divided by the rakia, is parallel to day two. And the land animals on day three matches the, uh, I mean, on day six matches the land being uh, created or coming out on day three. But without going to that share. Now, that's what I call objective analysis. What's the meaning of that parallel? That's subjective. So Chumash wants you, Chumash again is a book to study, not read. Therefore, Chumash wants you to study the book. Notice that one is parallel to four. It doesn't tell you in the beginning, oh, pay attention that one is parallel to four, two to five, and three to six. But when you study, you can't miss that it is. And therefore, Chumash wants you to notice that. And then ask yourself, what's the meaning? What do the commentators do? The commentators assume that you've done the objective analysis. And what they'll share with you is their objective interpretation. That's the rule of thumb. But because interpretation is subjective, there's no way to know for sure what's right. So what subjective interpretations are considered, um, I guess, legitimate? Or I guess, who has the license to make these subjective interpretations? We call that Jewish history or our tradition. And therefore, we call it Mikro Dolot. I, I, what I like to say is the base Medrash decides, or Amisar decides, which, which commentary is considered um, um, permit, uh, permitted. But what's more important, the most important Jewish tradition is we argue over what's the subjective interpretation. And every generation has more insights and every generation adds, and there's no end to that. Uh, the question is, which subjective interpretation makes sense and is acceptable? I call that the Beit Midrash or Amisel decides. Again, uh, speaking of Torah in motion, there's a lot of latitude with when we consider who's, who's considered Amisel. Again, not our topic today, that's a topic for a, a Yom Yun kind of thing. Now, when you do that objective analysis, what I, what I try to show with my students is that the main thing I try to do in class is, the object, is teach the tools of objective analysis, and then maybe I'll suggest subjective interpretation, or I'll try to show you how the commentators are presenting you with their subjective interpretation, how the commentators don't share with you their objective analysis, they assume you've done that, and they'll only share with you their subjective interpretation, but if you don't do the analysis first, you won't appreciate their interpretation. That's as far as methodology. Now, but when we find contradictions in that objective analysis between different sources, so there's what's called the critical approach and traditional approach. So the Bible critics, what do they do? They read Sefer Dvarim, they read Sefer Shemot, and they realize, hey, two different stories. And of course, I'm not even going to mention their, um, their, their subjective interpretation. How do they solve the contradiction? It must be different sources. That's called source criticism. And then they spend their whole time doing what I call an autopsy on Chumash and trying to figure out where everything came from, assuming with their basic assumption of no God or no, um, no everything's man-made. And the reason for the contradictions is because we have different sources and a later redactor putting the sources together. That, of course, is not our approach. Our approach is a traditional one, that there's one God who gave us the book. We argue how it was given, when it was given, you know, how God transmitted it, but it's all from one God. And if there's contradictions in the book, they're intentional. 
And the question is, what do we learn from those contradictions? So in the traditional approach of what we do with contradictions, I call it what I call the Tosfut style is, meaning it's really the same. If, you've, if you're uh, you know, a, a Talmudist and you follow Tosfut all the time, they'll take a contradiction between two sugyot and they say, really, it's the same thing. And this one's talking about this, this one's talking about that. For example, in, um, example what Rashi does in um, how could it be that on day three, there's already things growing in, this, in, the, in the story of creation in chapter one. In chapter two, things are growing. Um, nothing grows until man is made. So how could things be growing if man's not made till day six? How can things be three? So what's Rashi say? Um, things grew up until the, up until the uh, surface of the earth, until man was created. After God created man on day six, and they sprouted from above the earth. But that's the example. That's again, one approach. This is what I call the Rabroyer approach, which goes to Bechino, to two perspectives. Chumas intentionally sort of contradicts itself. And this Chumas does on purpose to teach you its message. And with uh, Rob Royer and his students, what they do, and they go out of the way to do it, even if it's not obvious, they search always for two perspectives. So it's really easy to find them in Perak Aleph and Perak Bet and Breshit, but they'll find it in almost every story in Chumash. In fact, if there's a story in Chumash that doesn't have two perspectives, something's wrong. Again, I'm sort of exaggerating on their approach. But we're not going to follow that approach either, but that's a classic approach. The Chumash does this on purpose. It's always presenting everything from two perspectives. And the question is, what do I learn from that double perspective? And it's a tremendous approach, but that was a very special form. Then there's what's called the literary approach, which tries to sort of, um, um, I guess, bridge the gap between them. And I'll just give a little introduction to it. It's called in Hebrew, the difference between mashikara and mashikatuv. I'll explain it in English. Mashikara means what happened. Many people study Chumash. Chumash is the ultimate source of what happened. And then I learned my lesson from what happened. Now, sometimes it's not clear what's happened. Therefore, what I need to do, I need to read between the lines and figure out what happened. So um, there's two people who were, um, who were um, arguing with Moshe. Remember when, um, you know, hitting each other in the beginning of Sefer Shemot. And it doesn't say who these two people are. What does the matter say? That's got to be uh, Dasan Baviram. And they have a nice, beautiful proof. And they spend all their time studying and trying to figure out what happened in Chumash. And they learn lesson from what happened. The literary approach says, if Chumash doesn't tell me what happened, it's not important. What's important is what's written. And therefore, the historicity is less important. The word of God is through the story. And therefore, when I study a text, the main thing I'm studying is what text, what's written in the text, not what happened in the text. There's a famous argument between, um, between I guess, in, in, if you know, uh, Harit Sion or um, Herzog Academy, Herzog uh, Teachers College, it's between Rav Maidan and, Rav, uh, and Yoni Grossman, pretty much where um, Rav Meidan is very much with the what happened approach, Masha Kara, and Yoni Grossman is called the Mash, Masha Katu. It's important. Both approaches are really intriguing. They're really great. And of course, the truth is always somewhere in between them. But once you realize that difference, whenever you listen to a shir, always pay attention. Are they focusing on what happened? And I learned from what happened, or do I learn from what's written? When we studied Mamad Har Sinai, the first year in Parsha Yitro, remember how it was so unclear what actually happened? So we spend our whole time studying what's written, and we explain how what's written might be the message. You know, the end clarity and what's written was the message. So again, I'm just giving an introduction to how we're going to deal with, with um, different approaches. I want to use another analogy. I call it CNN versus Fox News without being political. What do I mean? I can have the exact same event, and when I have a different perspective or different agenda, I hear different news. I can take the exact same demonstration or the exact same political, any event in history on the news, and if I watch it on one uh, news network, I'll get one view of it. I'll reach another network, I'll get a totally different view of it. You follow? I can say only 100,000 people showed up to the demonstration, or hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of people showed up. You follow? You, you, can take the same, you, you can take the same event and spin it based on your, on your agenda. Um, now, I'm, I'm not saying that's what Chumash does, but keep that analogy in mind. It'll be helpful to understand something coming up. And then we get to a bigger question about when you know this over and over again, Chumash is always seems to be contradicting itself and presenting its different perspectives. Um, what I want to do is my overall approach is as follows. In my opinion, Chumash is a book of principles, not necessarily a book of laws. Shulchan Aruch is a book of laws. And when it writes laws, it tries to tell you this is what you have to do. In Chumash, through its stories and through its laws, 
we develop principles. For example, when, when Chumash says, Ein tachet, ein, shein tachet, shein, the rabbis don't understand that as a law, they understand that as a principle. How to apply the principle? Chumash leaves that to the rabbis later on. And sometimes we have principles that might be in conflict. And therefore, I want to use the analogy of what's going on nowadays. I have principles of public health. It's very important to have public health. I also have principles of how to keep a strong economy. I have principles of environment. What happens when principles are in conflict? What happens when the need for public health can ruin an economy? What do I, what becomes more important? Or what happens when I have economic concerns, but also I have to worry about the environment? So everyone agrees that each one in itself is important, but what happens when there's conflict between them and how do you resolve the conflicts? Therefore, what happens in Chumash quite often is that, that I have, um, Chumash will present a law that will present a certain principle. Chazal, our rabbis will derive from there the principle and then apply that principle in real time in what the rabbi would call halacha. I think the best example of that is Masechet Nezikin, which begins with what famous word? Avot Nezikin. What's an av? An av is a basic principle. When Chumash, take, Chumash takes Parshat Mishpatim, in all the different cases about like, you know, an ox growing another ox and things like that. And instead of each case being a, a, a strict law, each case becomes a principle. The rabbis read Parshat Mishpatim, they derive a principle, remember called uh, there's Shor, there's Bor, there's Shein, etc. The Arba Avot Nezikin, it's four principles of damage. They derive the principle, and then when it comes to a real-time case, they have to apply all the different principles and make a final decision, which we call Halakha. And then, their decisions become the basis for the next stage of, uh, of application of laws. This is a whole like history of how jurisprudence continues. But when I read Chumash, the way I understand Chazal understand Chumash, they don't read Chumash as the law book, they read it as a book of principles. And Tor Shvapeh is the history of how Chazal take those principles and apply them. And the rule of Halakha is simply taking, you know, every generation or two um, sets new principles based on their application um, of, uh, I mean, they take, they set laws based on their understanding of those principles, which become like new principles, and then continues. Now, okay, that was my, that was my too long of an introduction. But finally, now to get to work on Sefer Dvorim. We have a concept of five books of Moses, that's why we call it Chumash. But the fact that we call them books, each book is a Sefer, that gives me a good reason to view Chumash not as five chapters of one book, but every book has its own agenda and its own purpose. And if we're going to find contradictions between the book of Shemot and the book of Amidbar, Vayikra, and Devarim, it's not going to be because it's different authors, but because they're different books, even though they're all part of what we call the Pentateuch, they're all from one God and they're all carry the same underlying purpose, because each book has a certain agenda, a certain theme, it's only logical that we're going to find what might appear to be a contradiction between them, but that contradiction is intentional, and that I can learn from the contradiction. Now, our shir today won't be um, so um, rooted in this problem, but that's going to guide us all the way through all of our study when we have contradictions. Meaning, once I understand every book has its theme, has its purpose, I'll give you an example we'll get to in Sefer Tvarim. We're going to find that in the book of Shemot, when it talks about Brit Sinai and the Ten Commandments and Moshe going in for 40 days, we're going to go from Din to Rachamin. That's going to be wool, a major theme, till we get to the second tablets, the second Luchot, and God's 13 attributes of mercy. We're going to find that Sefer Devarim also talks about the Ten Commandments and Moshe going in for 40 days, but there's no mention or definitely no detail of God's 13 attributes of mercy. That doesn't mean that Devarim doesn't think they exist. That's not the primary topic of Sefer Devarim. Therefore, it's not being mentioned. The fact it's not mentioned, none of the books cover all of Judaism. Each book has its own focus, and then when I have to go and take all those books and all the principles and apply them in real life, that's where the rabbis have to go and Take those principles and have what we call halacha. So now, now we finally get to our topic today of what's going on in Sefer Tvarim. And now we'll have a, a fun share. So what we did in our first year, we explained what was Sefer Tvarim. Let me give a quick uh, review. It's not critical to understand this for today's year, but I, what I tried to show you was that Sefer Tvarim is a set of laws that comes part and parcel with the Ten Commandments. And not just the Ten Commandments, but what's called Brit Sinai, the covenant that the Jewish people made to be God's people forever, which I think is a key event in Chumash. It was not just the fact that we received laws from God or a covenant, but we took upon ourselves the responsibility to be God's people forever. 
what we said about Tem Tudli, Mamnachet Konei B'Roi Kadosh, the Jewish people, after going through the Exodus and their redemption, receive a proposition from God at Har Sinai, do you want to serve me forever as God's people? Look what I did for you. Now do you want to work for me? Am Yisrael's nation collectively took upon themselves the responsibility to accept that proposition, and we took upon ourselves to be God's people forever. When we accepted that responsibility, first we receive a contract, which we call the Ten Commandments or the Ten Statements, which are called Luchot Abrit, that they're written in tablets called the Tablets of the Covenant, or the Luchot Ha'idut, which remind us, which is testimony to the covenant. But that covenant, the first contract has basic principles, but to take those basic principles and apply them to be a nation in the service of God, not just individuals serving God, but a nation with all its national institutions and national apparatus and everything what it means to be a nation, to be a nation, not just an individual representing God, that needs a set of laws and guidelines that guide not only our personal behavior, but also our national behavior. Therefore, the laws that come together with the Ten Commandments that Moshe receives together with them on the first 40 days will include laws about how to set up your, um, like how to set up a nation, how your political leaders need to act, the laws of a king, your judicial system, shoftim uh, b'shotrim, how do you go to war and when you go to war and who goes to war, your economic system, the seven year Shemitah cycle and things like that. That, that was our topic um, that we talked about before Shavuot. And in light of that, that's why the book has to begin, the main speech begins in chapter five with Moshe Rabbeinu repeating the story of the contract and, um, and then how the laws that follow that contract were first given to Moshe Rabbeinu with the first 40 days. These laws are so important because it's the key to fulfill the goal to be a nation representing God. It should, by keeping these laws, that will make us a light to other nations. And by keeping them, other nations will see our connection to God. And that will, from a marketing point of view, promote the concept of God to all nations. And therefore, these laws are so important, they need constant repetition. And hence the name Mishneh Torah. That was our main point. And just one last general point, which will slowly relate to today, is that there's an overall theme in Chumash that um, we call, I call it ethical, mon, I mean, it's always called ethical monotheism. That the main point of being Jewish is not the fact you believe in God. We take that for granted. It's the understanding that we represent God or we're serving God as a nation. And behind that is an assumption that if people, not just our people, but any people, if you believe in God, that will lead to a more ethical lifestyle. Uh, believing in God in Chumash, what Chumash calls Yirat Elohim, or the fear of God, is not necessarily something intellectual like uh, Aristotle would describe, that I could do through detective reason, I prove that's to be a God. We take the existence of God uh, for granted, but the idea that there's only one God, and therefore there's one God who's in charge of war and reign, and calamity in nature, and whatever there are, instead of many gods, which was the ancient understanding. But the way that God oversees his creation, what we call um, hashkacha, or uh, divine providence, divine providence is a function of man's deeds, not of man's, not, and therefore it's not ritual that will bring God's providence. It's not by doing a rain dance that will bring rain. But rather, Chumash is screaming this message throughout that indeed God watches over his creation, and he decides if there'll be famine or plenty, he'll just have to be war or peace and things like that. But God's providence over his creation, over civilization, is a function of man's deeds. And therefore, when you understand that, that if man, or at least civilization as a whole, again, we go on a national level, um, at a civilization level even sometimes, that understanding that the good of civilization is a function of the deeds of civilization, that understanding will lead man to believe to behave properly. That, that's key. And then we have to be God's model nation for how to behave. With all that in mind, now we're ready finally for Sefer Tvarim, because the main speech in Tvarim from chapter 5 to 26 is going to be Moshe Rabbeinu reviewing those laws for one last time, even though we reviewed them many times before. One last time he'll teach them as he's about to die. But before he gives that speech, Again, that was the main topic of the main speech, which is the main topic of the book. Before he gives that speech, chapters one through four is a standalone speech called an introductory speech where Moshe presents something to the Jewish people. But you must understand that that first speech from chapter one through four is introductory to the main speech. Because if you want to understand 
what does Moshe talk about in that speech? If you don't understand what the main speech is about, you won't be able to understand why it's jumping from topic to topic and what those topics are. I'll tell you what this speech isn't. The speech is not a review of Jewish history from creation until the 40th year. It's definitely not an organized review of Jewish history, even from the time of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. It's jumping all over the place from totally different events. When you understand the speech is introduction to the main speech, the primary topic is real simple. We're about to enter the land of Israel. Moshe Rabbeinu is about to die. And Moshe is worried stiff that the new generation is going to make the same mistake as the first generation. Moshe has every reason to worry because of our bad track record that even though he's going on and there's a new opportunity for the Jewish people to cross the Jordan and conquer the land, he's afraid that they're going to chicken out again like they did with Hatam Ragli. And therefore, as a shul rabbi or as a national leader, uh, remember there's a, there's a famous line whether national leaders, is their job to instill hope or fear? The classic chiluk I heard someone tell me the other day is that uh, Obama, I'm not taking sides, he gave a message of hope and got elected, and Trump gave a message of fear. And uh, the question is, it's not a question of good or bad or right or wrong, it's just how to get people inspired to do something. Do you do it by giving them hope or do it by giving them fear? Now, those are two different methods. The question is, can you follow up on your, can you follow up on your, on your message of hope and fear? And we'll see, Moshe is going to be giving both, both hope and fear. The question is, to make that happen, you need good leadership. And we'll see the leadership will be a massive topic in, in Sefer Zvarim. So again, Moshe is worried about um, the new generation, as he's about to pass on, that they're not going to take the challenge of conquering the land. And in his speech, he's going to deal with all those problems. Now, because he's about to teach these laws, which he received 40 years ago, but haven't been applied yet because these laws that he's going to teach in this speech apply primarily to how to establish this nation and the land once you enter the land, now, how to set up a political system and what you do with the land, going to war and things like that. All these laws should have been fulfilled 40 years ago when we got the Torah. But because of what happened in the desert, everything was delayed. Now, what was the main reason for the delay? The main reason for the 40-year delay was because of the sin of the spies. That's why chapter one will primarily focus on the story of the spies. But there will also be a theme of leadership in the first speech because leadership will be another major theme, which is going to make sure and ensure that the Jewish people, even though Moshe is dying, will continue and be successful. Now, so with that in mind, again, the Moshe is introducing the main speech which will be a set of laws that come with the Ten Commandments of what to do as you enter the land, conquer it and settle it, and how to establish a nation that will uh, represent God through its national behavior. Moshe Rabbeinu begins his speech in, in, um, in chapter 1, verse 6. Again, I'll just review Moshe Rabbeinu's fear. His first fear is the new generation will, will, he wants to make sure they won't repeat the mistakes of the first one. Um, and I'll give an example of other reasons why not to cross the Jordan. The fear of defeat. Remember? So, of course, the story of the spies. We'll see also the fact that when we were traveling around on the other side of the Jordan, we had to take a bypass road and didn't engage a dome in battle. A dome came to threaten us. What did we do? We built a bypass road. What's that look like? We have a weak army. God tells us we can't attack Moab. We can't attack uh, Moab and give some reason. So Moshe has to explain the reason we chickened out from a dome and the reason we didn't attack Moab in a dome and had to take this bypass road and didn't deal with them wasn't because our army was weak, but rather that was a divine command. We'll talk about that in chapter two, in the beginning of three. On the other hand, when we did have war with um, Sihon and Oak, boy, we won and God was with us. But what might they say? Why did we win? Oh, we had this superhero Moshe Rabbeinu doing miracles like defeating Og Melech HaVashan. But because Moshe Rabbeinu is about to die, so it could be they believe that we won those wars, but without Moshe Rabbeinu, there's no way we can defeat those big enemies like Sihon and Og. So Moshe has to explain that it wasn't me, that was God who helped you defeat Sihon and Og. We'll, we'll see that later in his speech as well. Not today, but in a later shiva when we go to that speech. Then, on the other hand, this was idea of fear. Now the reasons of hope. Why should we conquer the land? First, God had a divine promise. And besides the fact he already helped us, but he promised our forefathers. Also, we'll see, we have a large population, and Avery Yardane is not big enough for our country. It's, we have a be a nation, there's what to gain by, by conquering the land. That'll be a big topic next week of why he sends the, the, the spies. But most important, we'll see, um, as we're going to see, 
And this will be the main theme again uh, next week's year. But one of the biggest themes throughout the speech, the main speech and even the introductory speech, is not just knowing that God exists and knowing that God made you a promise. Probably can be, we'll, we'll see this, it's replete through the book and almost never paid attention to. It's not believing that God promised the land. It's not believing that God can't help you. The understanding that even though God can help you, if you don't keep his laws, he's not going to help you. And therefore, in order for company of land to be successful, you have to keep the laws and know the laws and follow the laws. That's going to be Moshe Rabbeinu's main message. I want to make that crystal clear again. We'll prove it next week uh, because it's, we need that to understand the story of the spies. But one of the biggest themes you talk about every day in Shema, I don't need a nation just to believe that God exists. I don't need a nation that God tell them, oh, God made you a promise. He's going to fulfill his promise. I don't need to believe that God can help you or that he will help you. I need to know that he can help me. But even though he can help me, it's important to know that his help is contingent on my keeping the laws. Because God's goal is not only for the Jewish people to be living in the land of Israel, for the Jewish people to be keeping God's laws in the land of Israel, because there's no point in our being in Israel if we're not representing him properly by keeping his laws. And we're going to make it, once you understand that theme, almost everything in Sefer Dvarim is going to fall into place. Now we're going to take a, now we're going to, now we're going to start studying Chumash. That was our introduction at four different levels. Now we're going to study the speech and we're going to do what's called objective analysis. Just one, um, a couple introductions to understand what we're going to do. Because it's uh, summer coming up and had not been for Corona, we'd be sending our kids off to camp or uh, our kids would be, um, Staffing camp and things like that. You can see that there. I want to give an analogy about leadership. If you've ever been to camp, sent children to camp, sent kids to camp, or been a camper or, or a counselor, there's two types of staff in camp. There's what's called Sebet Hadracham, and there's Sebet Chinuch. There's staff members who are in charge of teaching Torah, teaching laws, you know, instruction. Uh, not only Torah instruction, also um, you know, swimming instruction. But there's there's people who teach, I guess we call the word Torah, meaning instruction. And there's Sebet Hadraha, which is leadership, meaning there's a camp, there's a bunk counselor. Who's going to be in the bunk with the kids? Who's going to make sure they go to bed on time? Who's going to make sure you know, they don't get too wild? That's pretty much, it's like, it's like what we do, we, call, we outsource parenting to the school or to the camp, whatever we do. It's the job of the parent, but it's called leadership though. And therefore, sometimes in camp, the counselors in camp, the Hadraha, some of the jobs are leadership as far as taking care of the bunk and being the monk leader, being the, I guess, the madrich the kids look up to and with them, it takes them on hikes and solve when kids have arguments or fighting, who gets the top bed, who gets the bottom bunk bed and things like that. Um, you know, who's going to be the captain of the team. People, kids are going to argue left and right. Only, it's only natural people argue. Who's going to help them resolve the arguments? Who's going to answer their questions? Who's going to give them guidance? That's one type of hadracha. And there's hadracha, which is instruction and in teaching the laws. That's a different type of hadracha. That's called sevet chinuch and sevet hadracha. Now, um, and I have a little joke on here. That's a big question. What's the job of a shul rabbi? If you understand, um, you know, give it a reason to fire a rabbi. Is, is the rabbi's job to teach Torah? To, to have a great cheer, to give a speech, to inspire things like that? Or is the rabbi's job to lead the community, guide the community and solve conflicts? who gets Shlishi and who gets Hamishi and who gets to be Shul president and things like that. Is, is the, what's the job of the Shul Rabbi? Of course, he has to do both. But what's the main job of the Shul Rabbi? And most um, conflicts, most arguments between Shuls and the Rabbis are over what's he supposed to be doing. Is the Rabbi's job is to, you know, lead the community? Is Rabbi's job to teach Torah? In fact, um, when you train people for the rabbinate, the whole question about women rabbis all centers around this question. Is the job of the Rabbi to be the posek? You know, and to be the ultimate halachic authority, or is the job of the rabbi to be the, the community leader and guide and inspire and lead people to become God's people? In Chumash, there's the difference between a Kohen and a Navi. In a nutshell, the Chinuch staff, that's the job of the Kohen, to teach Torah, and the job of the Navi is to give direction when they will get there. Now, um, and good, that's the question, is the job to be instruction or conflict resolution? And we'll see how that's going to be important in today's year. Okay, now, finally, let's get to work. Let me move my screen over. And I'll give the English in a minute, but I'm purposely skipping the first five lines of the book because they're complicated and not our topic today. The first five lines is Chumash talking. That's the introduction to the book that these laws have been given many times before. 
And in the 48th year, Moshe again thinks he's lost one last time after he defeated Sihon and Og. And now in verse 5, on the other side of the Jordan, Moshe begins to explain the Torah following. And Moshe basically begins his speech in, in chapter 6, verse 1. Now, notice, how do I know his speech begins here? Because this is third person. Verses 1 through 5, Chumash is speaking in narrator mode. Starting in chapter 1, verse 6, Moshe Rabbeinu himself is speaking. Just I'll pay attention to what they call first person. Hashem Elokeinu. Okay. Hashem, our God. And then we're quoting what God said. But Hashem Elokeinu, as opposed to just Hashem. Moshe saying, Hashem, our God. He's speaking to the people. And he's quoting what God told them. Now, and if you, if you were students, I'd make you look for it. But Moshe continues talking from verse 6 till chapter 4, verse 40. But you can check that out on your own. What I want you to do, I'm going to move now to an English screen. And I want to do the first step of objective analysis. We'll do this together. Uh, let me just check what happened on the, uh, okay. Now, share screen, I'm sorry. And we have to go now to a Word document, not a Word document. Yeah, Word document. For me to read through us. There we go. No, I'm sorry. We want a real Chumash. There we go. X is we need numbers. Now we need Dvarim. There we go. Chapter one in Dvarim. Let me move my pictures away. Okay. Now, take a look over here, starting in chapter six. I'll give you an assignment, which I love to give my students. I have a long section here that, there's no, that doesn't have any paragraph breaks. What I want you to do, starting from verse six, you can read it in English or in Hebrew. Um, there's a topic that begins in verse six. I want you to find the smallest paragraph possible where does that topic continue to? In other words, what would for sure have to be in the same paragraph? Words, where, where's the first time I have a small digression from the, for the first topic? Just take a minute and just read a little bit here. Let me make this a little bit smaller. Words, read from verse 5, from verse 6, and tell me if there's anywhere where the flow sort of breaks up. I'm asking a real simple question, but I want to make sure that everyone's awake. So right in the chat, where's the first time we have a small digression from the topic? I'll just read, I'll read with you. It's like, Hashem, our God, spoke to us in Khari, saying, you've been sitting in Har Sinai long enough. It's time to move on. Go to the mountain of the Emirates and all the neighboring areas, all the places in Israel, up to the coast, the land of Canaan and to the Hargan Prat. Look, I'm giving you this land. Go now and conquer the land, which God promised your forefathers, Tavri, Misak, and Yaakov, to give them. And I told you at that time, I can't lead you myself. God is, uh, has um, multiplied you and got you like the stars of the heaven and got you to continue doing that. And how can I carry all your things together, et cetera, et cetera. So I want you to do, um, you can read a little more if you want. Is there any, at, at any point, was there a bit of a digression? With what plus it was, are any of these two came begin a digression? And just let me see where my, let me stop my share for a minute. Is there a chat here? Let me see the chat. Yeah, so use the chat. Oh, here's the chat, okay? I want you in the chat. Let me see if I can see the chat, okay? With what Pusik would you say begins a digression? Just want to make sure you people are awake. Okay, make sure you guys are right. Okay, I guess everyone's saying. Okay, okay, I, we have enough five, six answers, that's fine. Okay, but read eight, possibly nine. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's look at Pasuk 9. It's like, you can't miss it. Like, that was like, it's just a real simple question. The first three psukim fit together for sure. What's Moshe saying? Right. What did God tell me 40 years ago? 40 years ago, 39 years ago, God told us in Harsina, we've been here long enough. We've been there for a year. It's time to move on and conquer the land. We got the Torah. We have a brief. We have a goal. We have the Mishkan. It's time to move on and conquer the land like God promised our forefathers. Pasuk 10 starts a digression. And I told you at that time, I can't do it myself. And then that goes on. Now, I'm going to give you a five-minute assignment. This is critical to understand Chumash in this year. Maybe a three-minute assignment. What I want you to do, if you have a Chumash with you, even better. But I'll put it here on the screen. I'll make it smaller here for a minute. Um, the digression begins in Pasuk Tet. I want you to find where the digression ends and the main topic picks up again. I'm, I'm going to clarify my question. Everyone agreed a digression begins in Pasuk 9. I want you to find where does digression end and where does the main topic pick up again? 
if indeed that's true. So take a minute, and when you have an answer, write it in the chat. With what Pusik does the main topic pick up again? The only hint is it's somewhere on the page. <laughs> How's that? You guys can see up to Pasuk. It's somewhere between Pasuk Tet and Chaf. Okay, and when you have an answer, just write on the chat. And then we'll check it out. I guarantee we'll get more than, we should get more than one answer. But we'll take a minute. In fact, I'm going to take a drink. All right, let me take a look at my chat list here. A little fast, more. Okay, here's my chat. There we go. Let's see. I heard. Okay, okay. okay. I could have predicted this. Okay, let's take a look here. I got so far. I'll read the answer so far. Um, I said we had chapter. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Verse nine. I was. We had that from book. We started verse nine. Okay. Now. Okay. But okay. One thought verse 12, okay, verse 19, 19, three 19s, four 19s, five 19s, 118, another 19, after 18 means 19, okay, 19, 19, okay, almost everyone, let me take 19, oh, 19 and 18, okay, okay, perfect, okay, what happened is what I wanted to happen, now I'll, I'll explain what people wrote, in case you didn't notice. The question is, does the topic pick up in verse 19 or 18? It was, is the regression over in 18 or 19? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to stop the share. And luckily, we have another source sheet, which is much better. Here's our Word file. And here's what we did. Okay. Look at the speech here. I hope you can see this. Let me turn on. Let me do better. That's bad share. Wait, new share. Um, I have this in a PDF. PDF, maybe? No, not, not PDF. No, I was, the other one was better. Stop share. One second. Do this again. Start share. Screen share. And right here. The word file. Here we are. Okay. Let me just close. I'm going to figure out how to close that top piece up. Okay, I hope you can see most of the chart there. But take a look at what we have here. This is, everyone see the digression? Here, in Pasuk Vav. Remember, we thought Vavtechet, everyone agreed, was the beginning. Look, look, God's giving you the land, which I promised your forefathers. And if we would skip verse 9 to 18 and skip right to 19, that's what most of you said. 19 was the majority opinion by far. It's a perfect read, isn't it? I'm going to simply delete from Pasiket to Yudchet, this whole section here. I'm going to just delete all that for a second and read straight through. How would you read that? Look, God's giving you the land. Go and conquer the land, which God promised your forefathers. It was, God told us, look, I'm giving you the land. Look at the commandment. Bo or Shuatarits, go and conquer the land, which God swore to your forefathers. And what did we do? And we traveled from Chorev. We went all the way until we got to Kadesh Barnea. And what did God tell us when we got to Kadesh Barnea? God told us, we arrived now at our destination. Okay. See again, Ray, look, God's giving you the land. Go up and conquer the land. Did God promise your forefathers? Don't be afraid. And then starts the story of the spies. But again, I could take, let me just do it for the fun of it because I'm in Word. I could gonna shift delete this right now. Shift delete it. Right? And I have a perfect continuous story from Pasakat to Yotet. Everyone see that? And if, if the Pesukim that I just deleted, I'm going to put them back in a minute. If these Pesukim were not there, you wouldn't notice they were missing. Now, some people said verse 18. We'll get, we'll get to that very soon. We're going to entertain 18. But to do that, we have to go back now and read. What's, now we're going to look at this insert and see what's inside the insert. You with me? Now, there's no doubt now. Let me explain why we did this objective analysis. I'm trying to show you that if I'm following and analyzing the speech, the main topic is 40 years ago, we were on our way to Israel to conquer the land. Everything was going fine, and you guys messed up with the sin of the spies. The sin of the spies next week's share. But in the middle of that introduction, Moshe has a digression that talks about appointing 
um, other leaders. Agreed? Let's read that digression, and we have to see how that digression relates to the main topic of we're going to conquer the land. So let's look now in the, at the digression. Okay, so now we're going to read just the topic. Um, you know, we can do it in, I'll do it with the Hebrew, um, and then we'll see the English in a minute. But here we go. What's Beitahi mean? At that time, simple shot is when I left Harsina. You agreed? This is at the end of the second year, or the beginning of the second year. It's after a year at Harsina, when God said it's time to pick up a leave. We're in Parsha Balotcha here, aren't we? In Parsha Balotcha, we leave Harsina in Parsha Balotcha. And therefore, when I first begin, Beitahi doesn't mean Parsha Yitro, it means. And what I say, I said, Now, let me just prove to you for two reasons why this has to be Parsha Balotcha. We'll take a look now and stop this year, and we'll go back to our Chumash. But now we need different Chumash, I'm sorry. We, we have to take a look in Parsha Shavua. Go to, Sef, go to Parsha Balotcha, which is right here. And everyone knows the famous story that the people have a taiva for a taiva, you know, with the people complain about the food. And Moshe is not a happy leader. That that's not true. And people that they remember how good the food was in Egypt. And Moshe hears the people complaining in Pasuk Yud. And he gets very angry. And God's not happy. And this is what Moshe says. Moshe says, listen to his leadership. God t- Moshe tells God, Lama ha-ra-ota How come you're so evil to me? And how come I didn't find fine favor in your eyes? L'asumit masa ha-mezalai. To put the masa. Masa means the burden of this people on me. He says, did I conceive this nation? I give birth to them? Is it my responsibility that, to take care of them like a, a wet nurse takes care of a baby? Where do I have food to feed them all? They're crying to me. This is the race. Lo uchal That's word for word, Parshat Tavarim, isn't it? I can't do this myself. And Moshe says the big line, if that's what you want me to do, kill me now. I'd rather, just kill me. But before, but because they're going to kill me. You follow? Just, just get over with quickly. If Moshe is saying, you want me dead? You want me, you want me impeached? Just get over with now. And what's God's answer, basically? God's answer is, you need some help. God tells Moshe, give me 70 elders. Remember? 70 men from the elders of Israel, who you know that these are the elders. You know, these are accepted leadership of the people. Okay? Bring it to Omoe, and I'm going to go down and share the leadership, the, the spirit I gave you, and you'll share that, and that, that there's, they'll help carry the burden with you, and you won't do it yourself. Then we have the story. Let's stop the share for a minute. I hope it's perfectly clear now that the topic here, if I go to the camp analogy, I'm talking about hadracha, I'm talking about a bunk counselor, and not a teacher. I'm, I'm talking about hadracha staff and not counseling staff, and not teacher staff. Um, let's take a look now at our speech and see how, how it's a perfect match so far. So again, uh, what did we say? I told you at that time, I, I can't, um, like I told you, look, we had these words word for word, right? One acre baiti is exactly what we did for Sinai. That's Perak Aleph. I can't do it yourself, exactly Yod Aleph. And then Moshe refers to Bipet of Tarim. Hashem Echem you're many. You're like Ochvei Hashemayim. And God should continue to bless you, like he promised you with approval. Now, so far, in, in Balotcha, it's very negative. Moshe has like an attitude against them. But in Dvarim, there's nothing negative here yet. If you, if you follow carefully, we think it's negative because we always read this in Shabbos Dvarim, right before Tisha B'av. But what's Moshe saying? He says, I couldn't do this. He says, it's, don't, it's not your fault you're, you're so numerous, because there's no way, how can I possibly one person take care of 100,000 presidents? Remember? 100,000 people. You know the whole line about you know, how do you take care of everyone? Everyone's the prime minister in Israel. So he says, how can I possibly lead you myself? And what are Tarchem Masachem Rivchem for Shabbat? When you have a chance, look at the Parshanim of what Tarchem. Masachem is a key word, a burden. Tarchem, okay, what's, what's the Torah? Ask any shul rabbi. You can, be, you can have wonderful... That doesn't mean people are bad. Tarachem, it's it's just annoying. It's it's a it's a, a nuisance, listening to people's questions. Masachem is the leadership, and Rivchem people argue for good things, right? People argue good arguments, right? Do we open shul? Don't we open shul? 
That's not an argument between good and evil. Everyone wants good. Is, what's, remember conflicting values? You have a rave. Do we open shul? Don't we open shul? What's more important? The need to dive in or the, or the dangers of, of risk, of, of health risks? And therefore, what do you need to help you? Take for you, chachamim nevonim yudim l'shiftechem. Get some, you know, wise people. And, um, and then that was, that was um, that's what Moshe suggested. And the people answered, good idea. And that this is the famous line, this is for the fun of it. And what does Moshe take? Anashim chachamim v'yudim. Before he looked for chachamim nevonim v'yudim. And we only found chachamim v'yudim, but we didn't find nevonim. Because anyone nevon, doesn't take it, doesn't, doesn't want the job. I'm just joking. You know that it's a famous, all of Parshim pick up on that. That we look for Chachamim, Nevonim, and Yiduim, and we only find Chachamim, Yiduim, we don't find Nevonim. Now, um, but Moshe takes the leadership, he finds leaders, and he puts them in charge of you. You know, we have an organized system of, you know, uh, top down system like in camp, like there's Roshay Anath and Roshay Pluga. I don't think it means exactly thousands, tens, and hundreds. It means a, an organized system. Uh, a hierarchy system going down. And then what does he command the Shoftim? It's your job now as national leaders, be fair. Don't be nice, I'll take the camp analogy. Don't be nice to that kid because his father's rich. Or don't be nice to, nice to that kid because his father's on the board. And don't be mean to that kid because, you know, his father votes Republican, whatever it is. Got it, my point? In other words, you're leading the people, you have to be fair, you have to do things with justice, because you chose to do Mishpat and Staka. Therefore, Ushvatem Tzedek, remember Mishpat and Staka, the big thing back from Rashid, between everybody. Now, don't take your barim by Mishpat, don't take your barim by Mishpat, don't take your barim by And when you have big trouble, you come to me. Now, I could stop right here. And what's Moshe saying? When we left Har Sinai, it wasn't a one man job. I appointed leadership, and you had good leaders. And trust in leadership is key in national success. People need to know not only that they have leaders, the fact that the leaders are just is key to make sure that things uh, progress properly. The second people don't have trust in their leadership, everything falls apart. We'll talk about that when we deal with Chetam Raglin. We'll need all this next week for Chetam Raglin. What I need to finish up today, sure, because I'm in terms of myself, is Pasek Yud Chet. In fact, we had the argument that you guys had. Does Pasek Yud Chet belong with this section or not? Again, now here's what tricks people. After we appointed the judges, but at that time, I told the, the people we, that you agreed that I appoint, you know, your, your known leaders, it's your job to judge the people and help me with Hadrucha and be just and upright. That's, you're, you're not job is to be, your job here is to be Hadrucha. Your job is not to teach Torah. Your job is to make sure that justice mishpat and staka is done. How to apply that in every case that comes up in, in society. Now, I could stop right here, everything's fine. But sede etchem, who's etchem referring to? It's not the shoftim, is it? Who's etchem? Etchem has to be the people. So I commanded the shoftim at that time to keep all the laws. I mean, to let it go, to judge properly. But he commanded you at that time, et kolod v'meshir tasun. What is that? Atchem has to be the people. Moshe, now we finished quoting, we just finished the quote of what, hap what happened 40 years ago, as far as appointing the judges. As you came to me. I mean, I suggested, I, you helped me with my leadership. You agreed. We appointed staff to help, to help lead the people. And then afterwards it says, the staff was in charge of judging and guiding the people. But what did I command you at that time? I command you at that time at Kodron Meshur Tassun. What I want to claim is this is where the speech goes back to its main topic, which explains all of Stephen's very much. Explain what I mean. Let me show you the next, the, next, um, the next slide. Where's the next slide? Here. I want to claim like this now. I want to claim that even though it makes sense to, end, to continue with Yutet, and it makes most sense, unless I know the rest of Sefer Dvarim. I could, I could keep this as an insert, which talks about leadership. Again, we're going to continue this topic next week because this will help explain the story of the spies. I'm going to shift delete this. Shift delete. Shift. Shift delete. There we go. And what happened? 
Let's read this carefully. And this is key to understanding Sefer Dvarim. 40 years ago, God told me it's time to leave. We were on our way to go and conquer the land. And what did I do? But as we began our journey towards the land of Israel, what did I teach you? All the things that you need to do, which is nothing other than the laws of Sefer Dvarim. What did Moshe do 40 years ago as we began and embarked on our journey to conquer the land of Israel? I taught you the laws of Sefer Dvarim. And what am I going to do now, 40 years later, the exact same thing? You with me? Okay. And therefore, we traveled from Chorev and we went to Homid Bar until we got to Kadesh Barnea. Want a nice little proof? Just open up Sefer Dvarim. Look at the first line of the book. I'm sorry, right up here. Remember, what did we just read? I command you with Kol Vim Hashem Tasun, Eilah Dvarim, which Moshe told B'nai Israel when? Now in Eber Yardin. In the Midbar, Moshe gave the speech many times before. What is the main time Moshe gave the speech? On the 11th day journey, look at this. Let me make this even bigger. I'll zoom it up. Make it real big. Um, 200%. Let me make it big. big, but it's big, it's big. Okay. On the 11th day journey from Chorev to, to Kadesh Barnea. That journey, that 11 day distance journey from Har Sinai, Chorev to Har Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, is the journey that should have been the journey going to the land of Israel. Everyone agree? What did Moshe do during that 11-day journey? When they weren't traveling, they were sitting and learning. It was a seminar. And what laws were they teaching? All the laws of Sefer Devarim, of Shotim V'Shotrim, of who goes to war, when you go to war, all the laws of the marketplace, all the laws of the, all the laws of how to become, all the laws of becoming God's nation. That's what I taught you on that 11-day journey. What's happening now, 40 years later? I call it deja vu. 38 years ago, we were about, the nation was about to conquer the land of Israel. What did we do in preparation for our conquest? I taught you and drilled you over and over again, Mishneh Torah, the laws of Sefer Dvarim, from the Ten Commandments through all the laws that I got on the first 40 days in Har Sinai, which are how to make you a Goy Kadosh. We'll see this in the speech. And therefore, 40 years ago, when you began your journey in preparation for your conquest of the land, I taught you laws of Sefer Dvarim and drill them. What am I doing now? Now in the 40th year, got it? By, now in the 40th year, in the 11th month, Moshe is going to tell B'nai Sel the same thing again after we defeat Sichon and Og, and we're ready to go in and conquer the land. Therefore, the most important line in the speech in Perak Aleph, when I understand this setup, is exactly this line. I'm sorry. It doesn't end here. It begins, you know, it's, this has to be the digression And here, and this continues the speech. Because, what's the, because why is that important? The most important preparation for conquering the land is knowing the laws. And that's going to be the theme we're going to see in Sefer Dvarim. Okay, my time is up. I'll, still, I'll take questions in a second. But I hope that was clear. I'm trying to show you how you have to read when you read something and you want to understand what's going on. The, 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 there's no reason to mention Yitro. It's not even Shaykh Yitro. There's a bit of an overlap. All the Parshim deal with that. I'm looking at the wider picture. What's going on in the speech? What's the agenda of the speech? Moshe has to explain to them, why am I teaching the laws? The biggest thing is, if you don't keep these laws, there's no way God's going to help you conquer the land. Get over your fears. God can do it. But you need to know, not only that this is the time, you have an opportunity now, and God can help you, but that help is contingent on these laws. And if you don't know these laws, there's no way it's going to work. Because these laws that I'm teaching in St. Francis are the key. And therefore, what did I do 40 years ago? I taught you these laws. What am I doing now 40 years later? I'm teaching it called Bremelo. Eila Bremel should be Ben Moshe. And we'll see that in the next week's year, we'll see this over and over again. Now, this, now, to understand why we have this digression about leadership, we need this. That's the introduction, really. You know, this digression is key to understanding the story of the spies. I need the story of the spies to understand why it's been 38 years. Got it? Why these laws were given 38 years ago, why they didn't apply yet. I'm teaching them again. I need to explain why. We waited 38 years, and to make sure that mistake doesn't happen again. But the digression about the Shoftim, I only understand once I understand the story of the spies. But I understand why I need the story of the spies, because the story of the spies is why it's been 38 years. But the most important Pasuk is, I command you, it's called Rameshur Tasun, and that's why the book is called Sefer Dvarim. Okay, I'll say, did you have to, any questions were on the chat that were important for now?
earlier, somebody asked about, uh, are there new principles in Sefer Dvar? And there are many new laws, but are there really new principles? You had mentioned that. Oh, so I want to go back. I'm going to go backwards. The original principles are Sefer Dvarim. The new principles are in Vashmot and Vayikra. After Chetek. The original principles that come with Har Sinai are in Sefer Dvarim. Anything after Parshat Kitisa in Chetek Egel, that's new. So therefore, I'm going to have, Vayikra is going to change things. The second half of Shemot is going to change things. Vamibra is going to change things. When I read Sefer Dvarim, I'm reading the laws that came with the Ten Commandments. It's, I'm, I'm totally going against all, all the Bible. You follow? But by the way, the critics are finally coming up on this, that they realized it firms earlier than Shemot. It's like a new theory, finally. Well, you see, the laws of Shemot precede the laws in, in, of Shemot. The laws of Devarim are the first set of laws. They're the base laws. They're going to be adapted. That's why Dusha Bechor, that's why there's no Mishkan in Sefer Devarim. You follow? Because had, they, had we not seen with Chetega, we would need a Mishkan. So in the meantime, we have one. And most related, but the laws themselves reflect the original from 40 years, the, the original principles, not new principles. It's going to change the way we read, not just the barn, we change the way we read Chumash, but again, that's really complicated. I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because it's key to understanding the book. And I really, I think, I can see the last question I see, you can see them already at the end. Um, is your analysis following Rashi's understanding of the first words of the Pasuk? Of, of Sefer Dvarim? I'm assuming it means Sefer Dvarim, but I don't no, know no, if it's... I'm, I'm going, I'm following, we'll see that we're following Ibn Ezra and, and Ramban on Dvarim. No, I just explained the coin. What I just said about Achad Semi Chorev is exactly Ibn Ezra and, and Ramban. That this is when Moshe gave the speech. And he gave the speech on the 11-day journey. And we'll see, well, Moshe, it's so, it's, they're 100% right. You can't miss them. Rashi, Midrashically, is right on the... Uh, we'll explain Rashi also. Rashi says it's Moser. We'll see that Rashi is also right. Midrashically, is right on the spot. The thematically, he's on the spot. Shot level, Eben Ezra and Ramban are correct. That he's talking about the speech. Eda Dvarim is referring to the laws, the speech he gives from chapter 5 to 26. Rashi's talking about the muster that he inserts as he's giving the speech. Okay, thank you very much, Yersha Kork, for the very interesting uh, analysis. We'll see you next week, please, God. And uh, I'll, I'll try to do, I'll do every week, I'll try to give at least four or five minutes of actual text study with a couple of questions so we can make it like a class. A no, I really enjoyed the introduction part, the, you know, the whole, uh, you know, approaches to... That's what I was afraid of. <laughs> traditional. You're afraid I would like that the best. Okay. I want like, to remember... Like doing, I like doing Rav, the second half. <laughs> Rav, Rav Meitan and Rav, Rav, uh, Rav Grossman, I'm interested to hear a little bit more about their machloket on what, yeah, what but, is written but, and what happened. Yeah, but to appreciate what they argue about, you have to know, you have to see how, how to study first. Do you follow? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Okay. You gotta play ball to appreciate them, but how to play yeah. ball. All right. Everybody likes, you know, the different parts. Okay. Yeah, okay. Right. okay. okay. This okay. evening, of course, everybody's welcome. Mark Shapiro continues about his um, correspondence with um, Gedolim, as he mentioned, for those who are there last week. It, you know, each week is really independent, but it'll be talking about giving a, a heretic an aliyah. If you want to talk about heresy, a Bible critic, give, give an aliyah. That was talked about the issue that came up at Brandeis University when he worked there. That's where he'll be starting uh, his correspondence with Hank, Rev. Henkin. Last week, his body corresponds with Norman Lamb. He spoke about uh, Lava Shalom. Anyways, and tomorrow morning, Marty Lakshin, 11 a.m., is starting his new series on Ameh HaMitzvot. So Rabbi Liebtag talks about we have to teach the mitzvot, and now Rabbi Lecture will talk about why we have to keep the mitzvot, what the Tamei and mitzvot, and uh, we'll see you during the week. Follow, uh, of course, all the emails. We look forward to learning with you, and like I say, please invite your friends to come and join us, and uh, Baruch Hashem, I think we're growing. Our classes have been getting larger, which is great, and uh, we look forward to uh, learning with you online. I'll send you the outline for the show. Yeah, yeah. Please send the source sheet so I will post it on the website. Right, right. Somebody asked, we will post the uh, short sheets on the website soon. And of course, you can listen to this afterwards. Okay. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Be safe, be well. We look forward to seeing you at 8.30 this evening. Uh, it's 3.30, Menachem. If you get up early in the middle of the night and you can't sleep, you can uh, join us at 3.30 in the morning. I listen to the tape. I listen to the tape. Listen to the want. tape. I know. I know. It's I a lot better that way. Yeah. Okay. All right. Have a great right. day, everybody. Bye-bye.